just know that it was displayed in front of us 24 7 just like how she was explaining it AIDS, kids being hungry things of that nature mm -hmm. but as we continue to grow we was now able to open our eyes to the natural beauty of africa What's good, y'all? It's the Duma Shots React, and we're back with another video. Who we got today, see? Today we are back with another American reaction. Super excited about this video, guys. If you're new to us and, and we're new to you, you, make sure you scroll down, hit, hit that, that subscribe button, button, and turn on the post notification bell because we're, we're on the road to 100K. And we cannot get there without you guys, all right? Join the family. Without further ado, let's get into the video. I'm a storyteller, and I would like to tell you a few personal stories about what I like to call the danger of the single story. I grew up on a university campus in eastern Nigeria. My mother says that I started reading at the age of two, although I think four is probably close to the truth. So I was an early reader, and what I read were British and American children's books. I was also an early writer. And when I began to write at about the age of seven, stories in pencil with crayon illustrations that my poor mother was obligated to read, I wrote exactly the kinds of stories I was reading. All my characters were white and blue-eyed. They played in the snow. They ate apples. <coughs> and they talked a lot about the weather, how lovely it was that the sun had come out. <laughs> Now, this despite the fact that I lived in Nigeria, I had never been outside Nigeria. We didn't have snow, we ate mangoes, and we never talked about the weather because there was no need to. My characters also drank a lot of ginger beer because the characters in the British books I read drank ginger beer. Mm -hmm. Never mind that I had no idea what ginger beer was. <laughs> And for many years afterwards, I would have a desperate desire to taste ginger beer. But that is another story. What this demonstrates, I think, is how impressionable and vulnerable we are in the face of a story, particularly as children. Mm -hmm. Because all I had read were books in which characters were foreign, I had become convinced that books, by their very nature, had to have foreigners in them and had to be about things with which I could not personally identify. Mm. Now, things changed when I discovered African books. Okay, hold on. Before we go on to that, that is why, as parents, we have always, like, pushed our children seeing themselves and the things around them. Mm -hmm. So, baby dolls, when I was younger, it wasn't a popularity to have brown and black baby dolls. It was a popularity. We did have, like, brown cabbage patch dolls. Oh, but yeah. But most of the dolls that I had was Barbies. It wasn't even, you know, Barbies' friends hadn't even come out yet at that time, I don't think. Or at least it wasn't popular. Um, books, like she's saying, although we have, you know, all of the, like, um, the classic, um, the bears, the three bears, go to lock and the three bears. What's the other classics? Um, uh, I can't think right now. But the classics, um, you know, we still push them seeing themselves in books. Right, them right, seeing right. themselves. Uh, there was an author. I, I can't think of her name right now, but her books are on our bookshelf for our children. Um, there was an author who created a list of books for the males oh, yeah, and the yeah. females with all of the different inventors and, you know, inventors, politicians, like important black people. So they children need to see themselves regardless of what race you are. Not only do they need to see foreign people to them and people of other races and cultures to them, they have to see themselves. Yeah, that's a bar. That's facts. There weren't many of them available, and they weren't quite as easy to find as the foreign books, but because of writers like Chinua Achebe and Kamara Laye, yes. I went through a mental shift in my perception of literature. I realized that people like me, girls with skin the color of chocolate, whose 
kinky hair could not form ponytails could also exist in literature. I started to write about things I recognized. Now, I loved those American and British books I read. They stirred my imagination, they opened up new worlds for me. But the unintended consequence was that I did not know that people like me could exist in literature. Mm -hmm. So what the discovery of African writers did for me was this. It saved me from having a single story of what books are. Mm. Mm. I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian <laughs> family. My father was a professor. My mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new houseboy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit. And his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for mm. me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Yep, 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 hey, yep, that, yep. That, that hit home right there as well. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this is going to hit home with you too, because this is today's age where you may not have met a person yet, but someone is speaking on their behalf, mm. all the negative things about them, mm. painting a persona about them, and now you know that you don't want to ever talk to that person. Right. But the fact is, that's not true. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. We have dealt with a lot of that on this channel. Mm -hmm. A lot of, if a person speaks A-A-V-E, they're not intelligent. Um, they don't have a high IQ. Right, they, right, right. They, you know, don't have, they're lazy. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of stereotypes. And yes, we get a lot of love from all walks of life on this channel. But we also get a lot of hate as well. And yes, we, we have a lot of Africans who love us. And, mm -hmm. and they know we love them. But man, yep, yep. are we faced with so much more hate. Well, not much more. It, it don't out outweigh the good. Yeah, it don't outweigh but the love that we get. there is a significant amount of African people who come at us like, y'all don't know what y'all talking about. It's a lot. <laughs> Y'all don't know what we deal with. You know, right, and, right, right. and that's just Africans. We deal with a lot in other cultures as well as... Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, y'all are American, and not only are y'all American, y'all are y'all don't have a culture. Mm. We deal with a lot of that because of the one-sidedness that that media and the past has shown people. Yeah, we get to see the side of of, of life that a lot of people don't know is out there. Like Definitely. you may think that you deal with the little tip of the icebergs of what you see in the media or down the street. But in reality, there's so much, so much, so much more that words can paint a picture of for a person. You know what I'm saying? So Right. And a lot of people has, hundreds of people has, you know, just thanked us for creating the type of content and conversations that we lead. Excuse me, guys. Bridging the gap. That we lead. Bridging the gap yeah. and bringing awareness to not only America, what America is under the surface, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just in sharing our true life stories, our true life experiences, our perspectives. And it kind of bothers me when people be like, your perspective is wrong. How can our perspective be wrong if we have lived it? We're sharing hmm. life through our lens. Yeah, that never right? makes sense. <laughs> so if no, pers sense no perspective of life is wrong unless you're just a person who's just utterly focused on hate. No perspective of life is wrong. That is why we're grateful to have the platform that we have to have dialogue, create dialogue, understanding, love, and respect. Yep. You know, so. Create yeah. them doorways for y'all to come through. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music. 
and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> she assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What wow. struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Wow. Mm -hmm. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, yep. a single story of catastrophe. Yep. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in mm. any way. No possibility of feelings more complex than pity. No possibility of a connection as human equals. Mm -hmm. I must say that before I went to the US, I didn't consciously identify as African. But in the US, whenever Africa came up, people turned to me, never mind that I knew nothing about places like Namibia. But I did come to embrace this new identity, and in many ways, I think of myself now as African, although I still get quite irritable when Africa is referred to as a country, the most recent example <laughs> being my otherwise wonderful flight from Lagos two days ago, in which um, there was an announcement on the Virgin flight about their charity walk in India, Africa, and other countries. <laughs> so after I had spent some years in the US as an African, I began to understand my roommate's response to me. If I had not grown up in Nigeria, and if all I knew about Africa were from popular images, I too would think that Africa was a right. place of beautiful landscapes, beautiful <clears throat> animals, and incomprehensible people fighting senseless wars, dying of poverty and AIDS, unable to speak for themselves, and waiting to be saved by a kind white foreigner. I would see Africans in the same way that I, as a child, had seen Fide's family. This single story of Africa ultimately comes, I think, from Western literature. Now, here's a quote from the writing of a London merchant called John Locke, who sailed to West Africa in 1561 and kept a fascinating account of his voyage. After referring to the black Africans as beasts who have no houses, he writes, they are also people without heads, having their mouths and eyes in their breasts. Now, I've laughed every time I've read this, and one must admire the imagination of John Locke. But what is important about his writing is that it represents the beginning of a tradition of telling African stories in the West. Wow. A tradition of sub-Saharan... I'm going to mess up this, this, this man's name, but I know y'all going to know what it is. Hold up, y'all. I, I, I got to pull it up for this one because this was my um, quote for Juneteenth. I got to pull it up, guys. Put it up, baby. Get Wait it. Wait a minute. Let me put some quote Wait up minute, in it. Wait a minute because I don't like misquoting. I'm a writer. Mm. I don't like people to misquote me. Hold on. Let me get to it. You know, while you're looking for that, I can make a mention that we had a single side of view of Africa coming up. And it's we can't, we can't tell you whether we believed it or not. We just know that it was displayed in front of us 24 7 just like how she was explaining it AIDS, kids being hungry things of that nature mm -hmm. but as we continue to grow we was now able to open our eyes to the natural beauty of africa and right thank god to that right okay so the quote is until the line and this was in reference to juneteenth mm -hmm. um as you know juneteenth was just like last year i believe just um become a national holiday during the pandemic you know all of the george floyd um protests and you know that big movement our people had a shift and i feel like that shift was all over the world and a lot of people a lot of black people begin to understand what juneteenth was and what it means to our people and although my husband and our family started celebrating juneteenth like a couple years ago when we first realized what it was mm -hmm. guys juneteenth is not taught in our schools and it's our history right so this was in reference to juneteenth this is what i took this proverb to be um until the lions have their historians tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. Ooh. When you first wrote that, I was like, hold on. Now it's like, yo, that is a bar. bar. Because it's, uh, uh, read one more time. Read Let one more time. Let me read one more time, one more time for you. That is, that is crazy. Oh, yeah, the phone went off, okay. Until the lions, the lions have their historians. Have their historians. Tales of the hunt. Tales of the hunt. Shall always glorify the hunter. I'm just saying. 
I'm just saying. Until the Democrats oh, become the historians. Oh my gosh. <laughs> tales of the hunt shall always glorify what, what we are not taught in school about our own history and where we come from. Just to sum it up for y'all. Just right sum there. it up. Yeah. <laughs> Africa is a place of negatives, of difference, of darkness, of people who, in the words of the wonderful poet, <clears throat> Rudyard Kipling, a half devil, half child. Mm. Mm -mm. And so I began to realize that my American roommate must have, throughout her life, seen and heard different versions of this single story. Mm. As had a professor who once told me that my novel was not authentically African. Now, I was quite willing what? to contend that there were a number of things wrong with the novel, that it had failed in a number of places but I had not quite imagined that it had failed at achieving something called African authenticity. In fact, I did not know what African authenticity was. Uh, we spoke about uh, some similar to what she's saying, but her story to her professor or, or her teacher, it, it wasn't up to his standards mm. of what she felt she needed to put on paper. Although so she lived it. She lived it. Her experience and her imagination or whatever it was she's putting on paper was written from a perspective that made sense to her, and only she was able to tell it. So when he read it, he was like, "This is, this is not what I, t I this, I'm known for it to be like." So right. you did it wrong, right. and it's not wrong. This it's just not his experience. Exactly, it don't match what his perception was. Yeah. Mm. The professor told me that my characters were too much like him, an educated and middle class man. My characters drove cars. They were not starving. Therefore, they were not authentically African. But I must quickly add that well, I, to that too, just was guilty on the books. question of the single story. A few years ago, I visited Mexico from the U.S. The political climate in the U.S. at the time was tense, and there were debates going on about immigration. And, as often happens in America, immigration became synonymous with Mexicans. There were endless stories of Mexicans as people who were fleecing the healthcare system, sneaking across the border, being arrested at the border, that sort of thing. I remember walking around on my first day in Guadalajara, watching the people going to work, rolling up to tears in the marketplace, smoking, laughing. I remember first feeling slight surprise, and then I was overwhelmed with shame. I realized that I had been so immersed in the media coverage of Mexicans that they had become one thing in my mind, the abject immigrant. I had bought into the single story of Mexicans and I could not have been more ashamed of myself. Mm. So that is how to create a single story. Show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. Yeah. It is impossible to talk about the single story without talking about power. There is a word, an Igbo word, that I think about whenever I think about the power structures of the world, and it is nkale. It's a noun that loosely translates to, to be greater than another. Like our economic and political worlds, stories too are defined by the principle of nkale. How they are told, who tells them, when they are told, how many stories are told, are really dependent on power. Power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. The Palestinian poet Murid Baghouti writes that if you want to dispossess a people, the simplest way to do it is to tell their story and to start with secondly. Mm. Start the story with the arrows of the Native Americans and not with the arrival of the British, and you have an entirely different story. Start Ooh. the story with the failure of the African state, and not with the colonial creation of the African state, and you have an entirely different story. I recently spoke at a university where a student told me that it was such a shame that Nigerian men were, were <clears throat> physical abusers like the father character in my novel. I told him that I had just read a novel called American Psycho. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that it was such a shame that young Americans were serial murderers. <laughs> now, now... Now, 
Now, obviously, I said this in a fit of mild irritation, but <laughs> it would never have occurred to me to think that just because I had read a novel in which a character was a serial killer, that he was somehow representative of all Americans. And now, this is not because I'm a better person than that student, but because of America's cultural and economic power, I had many stories of America. I had read Thailand, Updike, and Steinbeck, and Gateskill. I did not have a single story of America. When I learned some years ago that writers were expected to have had really unhappy childhoods to be successful, I began to think about how I could invent horrible things my parents had done to me.